So our patient uh, overnight now uh, decompensate suddenly and um, now is starting to extend to noxious stimuli only. ICP is also uh, much higher, 25 to 32. You look at the heart rate, uh, 60, uh, ICP is 32. And the CPP is in the normal range uh, on large doses of vasopressors now. Pupils are slightly unequal now, and uh, the GCS is 4T, so they're extending. Um, and uh, you notice that you're already um, hyperventilating them, causing a uh, mild hypocapnia. And um, you're draining them. You gave mannitol, you gave Nimbex. Every hour now, uh, ICP is still out of control. So um, I'm just going to let the results trickle in here because um, I realize that I uh, only have about 20 minutes left. But uh, most of you want to obtain a CT head, which I agree with. We, we now have an exam change. We have poorly controlled ICP uh, with our first and second tier interventions. So it's definitely time to reassess. Um, and uh, so <clears throat> we're, we're now more um, in this range here. Uh, and now we're going to our tier three interventions. Um, and, you know, I think in a young uh, patient, uh, 19 years old, you have to give surgery a chance for these patients. Um, you know, we're talking about long-term outcome here, and I just don't think there's the data for uh, pentobarb as there are, is there is with, uh, with a decompressive craniectomy. Um, and uh, in preparation for that, here's your CT. So now we have a very different scan. The patient now has this large subdural hematoma on the left side, blossoming frontal contusions, some temporal contusions, and effacement of the basal cisterns. So this explains his exam change, and um, clearly now um, he's much sicker than he was before. So uh, we're thinking about decompressive craniectomy, um, and the Brain Trauma Foundation guidelines recommend uh, decompressive craniectomy uh, for reducing ICP. Um, which leads to a reduced mortality, but also increases the incidence of vegetative states. Um, so these are all things to consider when you're counseling patients' family about this decision. Um, you know, there's a chance that they may not get back to normal, a good chance that they may not get to normal in some cases when they have severe, a severe presentation of TBI. So you really have to talk to the patient's family about this. And if you're gonna do a decompressive craniectomy, a large decompressive craniectomy is what's needed. So 12 by 15 per reference is the size of the palm of my hand. So when I draw out the patient's incision, I put my hand right there and I draw, I draw my incision around it. And that'll give you your adequate uh, skin flap and bone flap. So what that looks like for a right decompressive craniectomy in this example is a reverse question mark incision. At our institution, we don't typically take it down this far because uh, you go this far in front of the ear, you might hit the superficial temporal artery, which is uh, the, you can actually see it on this 3D here, is gonna be the main blood supply for the skin flap. So you definitely don't wanna take that down if you can help it. Um, you want a huge bone flap. And the most important thing is that you get down to the floor of the middle fossa. So that's this gray striped area here. Um, and that's gonna be right behind the uh, zygoma and, uh, and you're gonna often have to use a combination of uh, ronger drill to get down that far, but you really wanna take the time to do that. And eventually you have this huge area of brain exposed and a, a large dural opening. Um, and then you close the skin. Usually you put a, you know, you put a uh, stylastic sheath or a dura matrix on top of it to protect the surface of the brain, but you then close the skin over this um, and you have your decompression. So after the surgery, the patient's exam improves back to what it was. So he's localizing again. ICP is now 10 to 14, so much better. He starts to actually follow some commands intermittently. Um, you try to extubate him, but you can't because of respiratory secretions and his, rest, his mental status is still a little poor, so you perform a tracheostomy. Um, and uh, just as a plug for our program, we also do all of our own tracheostomies in our ICU, some of them, most of them at the bedside at this point. And um, you also, um, have a peg tube placed. We don't do our own pegs, um, but uh, get the ready, get the patient ready, and is uh, discharged home with the family. Hey everyone, Ryan Rad here from NeurosurgeryTraining.org. If you like that video, subscribe and donate to keep our content available for medical students across the world.